This is Bob Bowen, and I'm thrilled to be uh, presenting this brief presentation for the uh, Back to the Basics series. Um, I'm going to talk about Before You Teach, Know Your Learner, and I Have No Conflicts of Interest. So what I want to do is I want to review the concept of learning styles, review some examples of learning styles, consider how we identify different styles, and then review the data for and against learning styles. So I've been interested in the idea of how we learn you know, ever since I figured out as a student that I seem to do better when I listen to recordings of my notes than simply writing them down. Although I didn't know that at the time, a lot of educators have been thinking about this too, and they were developing the concept of learning styles. So, what are learning styles? Well, they rest on three assumptions that individuals have a preference for a particular style, which they're probably born with, that they'll learn better using that style, and that when teachers match their teaching to that style, that students learn better. So, what are some different styles? I'm gonna give you three examples of different learning styles. They're by no means the only ones, but I picked them as they are commonly used. They represent three unique approaches, and many other models borrow or expand from these. First, the VAC or VARC model. This is a neurocognitive one. It thinks about how we incorporate knowledge to our senses. It was developed by a teacher in New Zealand named Neil Fleming, who coined the acronym based on what he thought were our main modes of learning, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Visual courses, you know, learning by seeing, auditory is learning by listening, and kinesthetic is learning by doing. Later versions of the theory divided up the visual into graphic learners who learn through pictures or videos, and those who learn by reading, hence the change to bark. Another approach is the experiential learning model. This one incorporates more theories about personality and how it affects our process or approach to learning. The experiential learning model was developed by David Kolb, who's an educational theorist at Case Western. It's usually just called the Kolb model and takes a different approach. Kolb divides learning into four stages. Concrete experience, in which a new experience or situation is encountered or re-experienced. Reflective observation, in which the learner watches and reflects on the experience with particular attention to any discrepancies with previous assumptions and abstract conceptualization or theorizing, in which thinking about the experience leads to new ideas or modifications of an existing concept, and then active experimentation, in which the learner applies the concepts to the world around them. Sounds pretty abstract, so let me use an example. Of course, a lot of clinical experiences might come to mind, but to keep this simpler, I'm gonna talk about something even more universal. When I was much younger, I took a trip to England. Before going, people warned me about British beer. Look out for the beer, they said. The Brits like their beer warm and really bitter. Well, when I got to London, I went to a pub and I had an experience. I ordered a pint of bitter and it was delicious. I reflected on this and compared this experience to what I thought I knew about beer. And then I had a mind blowing theory. Maybe beer didn't have to be freezing cold and tasteless. So I experimented with other beers pretty much through the rest of Europe, leading to near new experiences, all great. Now, my example is in the order I listed, but Kolb saw this as a cycle in which you could enter at any point. Maybe, for example, I might have read something about beer before I started experimenting. The important thing was that to really learn effectively, I had to go through all the stages. In fact, Kolb felt that each of us have a certain preference for where we like to enter the cycle. Those who prefer to start with concrete experiences that lead to reflecting have what Kolb called a diverging style, in which they first like to feel the experience and then watch in order to reflect. Whereas those who like to watch and reflect in order to form a theory have an assimilating style. They like to start by watching something and then thinking about it. Those who prefer to start with an abstract idea and experiment have a converging style. They think and then they do. And those who like to experiment, which then leads to new concrete experiences, have an accommodating style, which they do something and then experience or feel the result. Depending on your style, you would approach a problem in a different way. So the divergers prefer to feel the experience and then watch and reflect before forming a theory which they can then test out. So feel, then watch, then think, then do, and so on. With each of us having a preference for where we like to dive in. The third learning style I wanna consider is the tripartite model. This is really a metacognitive model and it's more interested in how our motivations affect our learning strategy. The tripartite model was developed by Noel Entwistle, a British educational psychologist, also in the early 80s. He divides styles of learning based on the learner's approach and motivation. His categories included deep learning, in which the student approaches learning with intrinsic motivation and personal interest, strategic learning, in which the motivation is to be successful, such as doing well on a test, and surface learning, in which one is motivated by fear of failure. 
The approach to learning is then influenced by the motivation. Deep learners want to learn everything there is about a subject. Strategic learners tend to be patchier and focus on what is likely to show up in a test. And surface learners tend to rely on rote learning with poor understanding of the subject. Unlike some of the other approaches, Entwistle doesn't uh, suggest that any of these styles are innate but that as learners, we move between the approaches depending on our circumstances and our motivations. So these are just three examples. And as I said, there's plenty of others as well as plenty of attempts to categorize them. Which one's the right one? Well, it seems clear to me that they're all just related. You know, different approaches to understanding the same problem of how do we learn. So instead of listing more, I'd like to consider the question, how do you determine this particular style for a student? <music>a lot of systems rely on simple self-assessment. So I, for example, just decided I was an auditory learner because I knew that I seemed to enjoy listening to things. And yes, when asked, most people will describe a learning preference. However, what we prefer may not always be how we learn best. A lot of models have associated inventories or questionnaires. For example, when using the Cole or experiential model, students are usually first given something like this. For example, how would you answer this? When I learn and the choices are I am receptive and open-minded or I am careful or I analyze ideas or I am practical. And you would have to rank order these from one being the least likely to four being the most. Or how about this one? When I'm learning, I'm an accepting person or I'm a reserved person or I'm a rational person or I'm a responsible person. How you rank these helps you understand where you fall in Kolb's experiential model. For example, if you're receptive, open-minded and accepting, you likely fall in the experiential domain. Whereas if you're careful and reserved, you're likely a reflector and so on. So what does the research say about the validity of these styles? Studies generally test one or more of the main hypotheses of these theories, which are that once again, that individuals have a preference for a particular style, that they will learn better using that style, and that when education is matched to the style that they learn better. The first hypothesis that people have a preference is really the easiest. A number of studies have shown that when asked, people do have a preference. For example, Baggin and colleagues were able to group medical students into one of the VARC categories based on a questionnaire, and it had reasonable stability over time. And Meyer and colleagues studying a group of chiropractic students learning anatomy found that most were multimodal learners with kinesthetic and visual preferences. And Lou and colleagues studying an international sample of medical students found that when the VARC model was applied, most students had a kinesthetic learning style. Of course, just because individuals have preferences doesn't mean that the different styles actually exist or that a learner can correctly identify their own. This is better addressed in the next two hypotheses. For example, hypothesis two, can individuals learn better when they use a preferred style? This is more debatable. It rests on the supposition that any learning activity can be cleanly divided into one modality or one approach. Some authors have tried to parse this, for example, Kumar found that teaching about learning styles helped students to identify their own. And then the students did feel more confident in their learning, although like many of these studies, there was no objective outcome measure. Most learning, of course, is multimodal. Some authors suggest that even if we could restrict students to one approach, this isn't desirable as our students will have to learn to adjust to a multimodal world once out of training. So there's less good research in this area. But the most important hypothesis is probably the third uh, does matching styles to teaching methods improve learning? This is, after all, the key issue for us, as it involves what we can modify as educators. Unfortunately, the evidence for this is weak. For example, Cook and colleagues used 123 medical students to see if matching their predetermined learning style to a teaching method would affect learning outcomes. They found that their efforts had no effect. Another study, also led by Cook, took a similar approach with web-based learning. Again, no effect. Vaughn and Baker also examined teacher-to-learner pairings, again with no meaningful outcome. And in a recent review of the literature, Willingham and colleagues asked the question of whether the existing data in any way supports the idea of matching. Let's imagine how they would approach this. Let's say you assessed students to be either visual or auditory learners. Then you use two methods, watching a film and listening to a story to teach the same thing. And then you tried each out in a subset of learner. And you got these results. Here's watching a film, and here is listening to a story. Would results like this support the validity of learning styles? Well, yeah, it would. You see, the visual learners do better than the auditory learners with the film, but the auditory learners do better than the visual learners with the story. But does this evidence make you want to start matching teaching methods with learners? No, 
everyone still does better with the film. To justify a curricular change, you would want to see something more like this. So which pattern is actually supported in the literature? Well, several decades of studies would suggest, sadly, neither supported. The evidence for learning styles, as well as teaching matching, is consistently weak. Interestingly, despite the lack of supportive evidence, the idea that teaching methods should be driven by learning styles persists throughout all levels of education. For example, when I look to see how often people searched for information on the VARC learning styles in Google, you see it's been relatively consistent for about the last decade. That's because I guess it seems so intuitive. It also lends itself to confirmation bias. Newton's 2015 review of learning styles, for example, showed that most articles about learning styles start with the assumption that they're valid and they go from there. Newton calls learning styles a neuromyth that just won't seem to die. So what can we reasonably conclude from the literature? I think we can agree that when asked, individuals do have a preference, and that preference is pretty consistent over time. But we don't know whether teaching to those preferences leads to better learning, which then begs the question, why am I even talking about this? Well, not all the evidence is bad. There is some data suggesting that how we go about learning does matter. For example, Ferguson did a meta-analysis of studies using the tripartite model and found that strategic learning, that's learning motivated by the desire for success, was associated with academic success, while surface learning, learning motivated by fear of failure, was negatively associated with success. And subsequent studies continue to support this. What was also important in these studies is that there was no evidence that any particular approach was intrinsic to any learner, just that method and motivation mattered, which is interesting because that's modifiable. For example, Fox and colleagues, also using a tripartite model, found that students could successfully learn to modify their approach based on their current need. Others have confirmed this. However, this works both ways. Papenzak and colleagues found that first-year medical students respond to the increasing load of work by moving from a strategic to a surface learning approach. Also worrisome is a series of studies from 2009 to 11 looking at med students' responses to the introduction of a new curriculum that was specifically designed to promote deeper learning. I like one of these titles, Why Is My Design Not Working? Well, it wasn't working because they too put too much faith in their curriculum and forgot about the students. It's just not that easy to make people start thinking deeply. They concluded that learning styles did matter, but that they're complex, hard to influence, and that one size does not fit all. Which is what I take from this literature. Maybe we should stop talking about learning styles. Instead, we should talk about learning approaches and asking the question, how can we teach in a way that encourages more successful approaches? For example, Sverko and Mellenby found that they could encourage deeper learning by creating more enjoyable material, using clinical case materials to make it more understandable and much other literature supports this. In other talks, you're going to hear a lot more about teaching methods, so I don't want to say too much about that, but I do want to suggest that as you start to think about different teaching methods, you should keep in mind that the goal of these methods are, in part, to try to influence the learning approach, but doing that is hard. So to summarize, there is mixed evidence for learning styles, but better evidence for learning approaches and some evidence that when students are allowed to use the preferred style, they are more confident and more motivated to learn. There's also good evidence that students are able to adjust their learning approach depending on the situation. It is interesting that for med students, strategic learning seems to be the most successful. Although I didn't discuss this, I would mention that this differs from many other graduate settings in which deep learners do better. Why is this? Well, I think it's because our students are very smart. They're able to appropriately adjust their style to suit their task. Thus, if their goal is to do well on a test, then yes, targeted strategic learning does make the most sense. But if we want them to develop a deeper understanding of the material, then we need to find ways to properly motivate them. Sure, most of what we teach is fascinating, but students don't have the time to delve in deeper if they don't need to. So how we teach does matter. The more we make our teaching accessible, relevant, and enjoyable, the more students are likely to want to go deeper. And what types of learning styles should we, we be teaching to? Well, really all of them. We should be aware of the VARC model and think about how to stimulate all of the senses. And the COLD model, we should think of ways to encourage new experiences, reflections, theories, and experiments. And yes, this is all important, but we mustn't forget that how we evaluate our students influences their learning preferences as much as how we teach. So although we may groan when our students ask us, is this going to be on the test, how can we really blame them for wanting to know? And as I listen to the later presentations in this series, I'll be interested to hear
how both the teaching and evaluation methods can encourage motivation among the students to move beyond simple strategic approaches. Thanks. Thank you.